Um, I'm here with uh, Brigadier General uh, Mike Neal. My name is Yonor Wasito, and we're recording this uh, for uh, possible inclusion in official Marine and uh, U.S. government uh, historical archives. Uh, I have the honor today of uh, speaking with a, a Navy Cross recipient um, and a veteran of the Vietnam War. Um, and General Neal, um, first I'd like to ask you about your uh, background, where you grew up, and how you came into the U.S. military. Well, my father uh, was a 30-year Marine. He uh, entered the Corps in about 1928, I believe, at the height of the Depression, and there were just simply no jobs available. He was a very qualified athlete. Uh, he got out of the Marine Corps briefly in 1932 and toured with the Chicago Bears to popularize uh, professional football. He was a member of an all-star team that toured the United States with him. Still no work uh, available, and he came back in the Corps and continued to serve. He served in Vietnam, I mean, World War II on Ta Saipan and Tinian. He was an artillery uh, officer. He was XO of a battery. Uh, he developed a kidney infection, came home before the invasion of uh, Iwo Jima, and I saw my father for the first time right here behind this house that we're in right now. Uh, he was walking up the uh, sidewalk on Venice Court, and my mom saw him. She yelled, Gene, he yelled, Grace. He dropped his sea bag and tussled my hair as he walked, carried my mom upstairs. In any event, that was my first time that I could ever remember meeting my dad, and he retired in 1958. Uh, I went to San Diego State High School here locally in San Diego. There's a Sigma Chi out there, played basketball as captain of the freshman team, played one year of varsity, and uh, was just an all-around uh, fraternity guy, and I made pretty good grades and went to Europe with two of my fraternity brothers after graduating, toured around for six months, then went to law school for three years at Berkeley. Berkeley at that time was very uh, anti-war. There were a lot of, uh, in my third year of law school, there was burning the flag, anti-war uh, protests all over the place about Vietnam. And one night I went to see a movie that demonstrated the, supposedly demonstrated how the VC were really winning the war and were the great friends of the people, which was a big lie. It was a communist back uh, film. And they showed an American helicopter being shot down. And when the helicopter landed on its side in this rice paddy, the uh, blonde haired uh, either a soldier or a Marine climbed out of the helicopter and stood. And as he went to jump off the side of the helicopter into the rice paddy, a 50 caliber round hit him and he fell face down the rice paddy and this audience cheered. I was so upset the next day I went over and joined the Marine Corps, signed up in San Francisco with a Captain Larson with a promise and proviso that I would be an infantry officer and not a lawyer and that they, I would delay my enlistment until October of 66 so I could take the bar exam. Which I did. I went to OCS in '66, then basic school, and I went to Vietnam as an infantry platoon commander with one seven. Thank you for that background, sir. Um, were you aware of um, General Donovan in World War II, who followed a similar uh, career pattern of uh, going to law school and then serving uh, as a uh, combat arms officer in World War One? I actually wasn't, no. I, I, I've heard of him, but I, I did not know that about his pattern, no. Um, then moving on to another um, Irish uh, topic, your family name history, Neil. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your family history and uh, why you take such uh, pride in uh, the Irish warrior culture? Well, we're O'Neill's on my father's side, and like a lot of mix coming over there, the for whatever the reason, the O's and the mix were dropped. So it was O'Neill on my father's side and O'Sullivan on my mother's side. And uh, my father's side came over very early on, and I can only assume that it may have been associated with the flight of the wild geese. My mother's side uh, came over.
race-oriented uh, family. Uh, thank you, sir. And then what I'd uh, like to ask you about in detail is uh, the combat action in which you uh, received the uh, Navy Cross. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you to uh, walk us through it um, step by step and then uh, using some of the questions from this debrief format uh, to orient uh, beyond whatever of those questions you find uh, the most relevant to the uh, action. Um, and I'd like to ask you to um, reference your map as to the exact locations of where that uh, occurred. Well, that, uh, that action occurred in December of 19... 67, and it was at the mouth of a valley that we were very familiar with uh, on the map. If I can find a map here that shows, I've got a number of maps, and uh, let me just find one that uh, orients me uh, properly here, if I can just take it. And then all the citation uh, of the uh, Navy Cross is really uh, quite extraordinary. Um, the references that for extraordinary heroism while serving as platoon commander with Company D-17, 1st Marine Division, during operations on 20 December 1967, uh, then Lieutenant Neal was informed by a squad size ambush patrol that an estimated 100 Viet Cong were moving toward its position at Phuoc Ninh Two in the Quang Nam province. And from there, I'll let General Neal describe the actions. Well, to properly describe this, I had placed three, my three squads in three separate ambush sites. And I was back in a village which we, a very small village which we knew to be VC. Uh, and we took that over and had, uh, we were actually hoping for four different ambush sites to be And uh, a young corporal by the name of Larry Smedley uh, spotted him. His squad consisted of seven men that night. My squads were about averaging eight to nine men. His was down a little bit. He did not have the machine gun because I'd placed the two machine guns that we did have with the other two squads because I thought they were more likely to make contact. I let the company commander know, called back the company and said, send out the reaction platoon, which I knew was headed by Lieutenant Richard Gannon, my good friend, and get them moving. I let battalion know that start, uh, get the artillery battery up and ready because we had on-call fires and get helicopters, get us everything we could up, including spooky because this was going to be big. Got back to uh, Corporal Smedley and said, shoot him, and he lit up the sky uh, on these uh, bad guys. The hardest part then, you want me to just continue? Just continue, yes, the sir. The hard part then is bringing together my other two squads and joining up with Larry, and there was a lot of radio transmission going on during that period of time, coordinating, the, telling them where we're going to meet, and moving out with my group, leaving a motor, um, uh, mortar uh, detachment behind and a couple of other Marines from a headquarters group of mine in the village. And then we, I united, linked up with my other two squads and then the hard part was linking up with Larry Smedley's squad without shooting each other. The hardest part about moving at night in the jungle, as any experienced Marine knows, is not shooting your own men. And the enemy was everywhere. They had scattered everywhere. And at one point in time, uh, one of my point men uh, called me over and pointed out some individuals below. I could not, none, none of us could positively identify them as enemy. So I took it upon myself. We didn't shoot them. I'd rather have 
100 BC get away than shoot one Marine. And we eventually linked up with uh, Corporal Smedley's squad, and then we pressed the attack on the enemy when which we saw him fled, and that began the real battle of the night. Very well, sir. So uh, just to um, go through some of these uh, points, uh, what was the enemy intention and most probable and dangerous course of action? They were intent on moving into rocket Da Nang and the airfield and uh, any other uh, sites they could, including the MO dumps, which they had successfully hit before. And were there any exploitable weaknesses or critical vulnerabilities for the enemy? Well, I think they just did not expect us to be that far out into the valley uh, entrance as we were, nor did they expect us to be as familiar with the area as we were. And speaking of the area, can you point out on the map where this uh, was located? Sure. Now, it's going to be a little difficult to see here, but... Uh, grid and were, the actual fighting took place closer to Fuak Nin 5 than Fuak Nin 7, somewhere between the two of them. Very well, sir. And then moving on, and thank you for your uh, um, description on um, the map you carried with you over 50 years. Um, moving on to your decision as a commander. <clears throat> How did you intend to exploit the enemy's uh, weakness, vulnerability, or how did you uh, intend to accomplish your commander's intent? Well, kill as many of them as possible. I mean, my philosophy then and still is, in combat, every, every enemy you can kill saves a Marine's life. And uh, by, they um, had real issues with being attacked. They pretty much were used to just coming into areas and never being hit, and we scattered them big time. Yes, sir, and your citation uh, cites that uh, disregarding the intense enemy fire, you led your men across 1,300 meters of thickly forested terrain to the Marine Patrol, which was heavily engaged with the enemy force. Uh, when the advance was halted by intense small arms, automatic weapons, and rifle grenade fire from the hostile positions, with complete disregard for your own safety, exposed yourself to the enemy fire to hurl hand grenades and direct your men's fire, which momentarily silenced the enemy weapons. Well, we were, like I say, we were all together at this point in time and sweeping towards the area where the enemy had last been seen, when all of a sudden we got hit by the small arms fire and grenades. I mean, it was pretty intense. And uh, we just attacked into it. Uh, I wasn't the only one throwing grenades and attacking the enemy. All my Marines were. Uh, Corporal Smedley was killed about this time in attacking a machine gun position that was firing at him. And um, we, uh, I had to quickly uh, form a, uh, a, a circle around I had several wounded Marines at that point in time and two KIAs. And we'd also stumbled into some, what later turned out to be 122 rocket launchers. So we were right, we were pretty much surrounded at this point in time. Many of them were duds. That was our experience in Vietnam, but uh, they would still go off and cause a serious injury. So we wanted to protect them, and we just laid down a base of fire and uh, pretty much held our position throughout the night until uh, Lieutenant Gannon's uh, platoon was able to reach us. Speaking of uh, Lieutenant Gannon, um, 
What was your uh, relationship with him? Uh, I think in a previous conversation, you mentioned that you went through the a basic school class with him, but you maybe didn't know him at that time. Very That's well. right. He was in a different company, as I recall. I basically, we had three companies go through. We had the largest graduating class from the basic school up until that time, and I think at any time in the future. But um, he, uh, we became fast friends because we joined uh, Delta One Seven about the same time. We uh, would generally stay in the same bunker at night. We have a, uh, on originally we were on a, a hill called Fifty Five, where there was an old French bunker that we stayed in. Hill Ten, we stayed in tents, but that was for a very brief period of time. And our longest stay was on Hill Forty One, which was occupied solely by Delta Company, and we lived in an old French bunker about. 20, 25 feet underneath the, underneath the ground, reinforced, and could have taken in probably a direct rocket attack, and we would have survived. But we were stuck out there, and we got to know each other very well. We shared letters, we talked all the time, and he was big into Shakespeare, as I recall. Um, <clears throat> thank you, sir. And then moving on to the execution phase of a, this debrief, uh, what did the enemy do that surprised you, or what? Uh, decisions were made, and how were these understood and executed by your subordinates? Well, what surprised me during the night was they hung around and kept fighting us. I generally, uh, by then, you know, we were outnumbered, uh, but I was surprised. Generally, they would break off and go, but I, I, the reason was was because we had their 122 rocket launchers within our circle, which at first we didn't have a clue what they were. I thought they were 105s. Uh, uh, tubes myself, and it wasn't until sunlight that we re realized that we had something more than that, and uh, so that kind of explained the reason why they were hanging around. Plus, we had uh, several of the enemy within our lines, which we killed during the night, and uh, some of very close hand-to-hand -hand stuff went on. So they were uh, not only fighting for their the weaponry, but they were fighting to get their buddies out of their circle we were in. Yes, sir, <clears throat> in your citation references that you picked up a wounded man's M79 grenade launcher delivered intense and accurate fire against the enemy, and when the momentum of the attack decreased, you rallied your men and led a determined assault under the face of the enemy fire, throwing hand grenades as you advanced, destroying a machine gun emplacement, and mortally wounding several enemy with your pistol. Well, you know, a citation can never accurately, totally accurately describe what went on, but it was all fast and furious, and uh, I wasn't the only Marine that was doing that. All my Marines were fighting, and it was really them or us, and uh, I'm yelling and screaming and do this, do that, and. Uh, at one point in time, as my radio operator could tell you, we're taking intense fire from above, and I yelled at one of my squad leaders, Scorpio, better get that man. We're not using real polite language like I'm using right now. I said, get that son of a bitch and kill him. And he grabbed his squad and without a second delay, charged up the hill and killed that numbers that mine did. I, I, I had trouble for taking, if I just counted my platoon alone, I'd be lucky if I had three squads of eight men apiece. Then we reinforced with a couple of uh, machine gun uh, crews, so that'd be two additional men with a machine gun. And then you had your corpsmen. My corpsmen were just as much riflemen as anybody else. Had one uh, corpsman one time that did not not want to carry an M16, a new one. The second patrol he went out on, he had his M16 with him. But uh, we just, 
The biggest thing I have an objection to, whether we did in Vietnam, was we did not train as units before we went into combat. I took over a platoon that was brand new to me, and I did not even know the name of one of my squad leaders. So was, I was totally new to them. So every unit must train before together before it goes into combat. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so that um, goes to uh, my next point of what would you do differently? And then the other question is, what was your unit's strength in execution? Well, that night, like I say, I mean, when I went out, I had a mortar detachment, 60 mortar detachment with me. I had a Kit Carson with me. Was a Kit Carson was a former V. and uh, wrote a book, um, The Village, about a combined action platoon. Um, what was your opinion of whether or not that would have worked at a broader level um, as General Krulak discusses in his book, uh, First to Fight, in his chapter, Clash of Strategies? It would have worked. I'm all in favor of it. I uh, wasn't in favor of it then. The only problem is they robbed my platoon and other platoons of men to, um, to serve in those CAC platoons. And uh, those CAC detachments were very effective in protecting the villages along with the, what we call the popular forces or the PFs that were in the villages. Uh, I uh, personally, uh, although wasn't authorized to do so, gave every grenade that I could and every uh, single kind of support I could to a CAC unit that was very close to a village that uh, I was, uh, that our Marines were very friendly with. The truth is, most of the, most of the Vietnamese villagers in the countryside would have preferred to be on the American side. I'm convinced of that. Because we did not take their rights, we did not force their young men into our armies or anything else. We gave them medical treatment. But the VC uh, did not. They forced their men young men into their uh, army, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're fighting forces, and if given the choice, I think they would have, given the choice, probably the villagers would have liked neither one of us to be there, but of the two, they would have taken us. But we fought the war all wrong anyway. Uh, we should have done that, but meanwhile, we should have taken the war to the north. That's a whole other issue. Well, uh, let's discuss that issue briefly. Um, General Krulak, in his book, um, describes his 17-page memo that he attempted to have the uh, President of the United States enact, uh, and one of the things that General Krulak suggests is that we should have bombed uh, Hanoi and Haiphong. Um, do you agree with that? Absolutely. We should have bombed the hell out of them, and that doggone bombing hall we had only reinforced their ability, ability to fight. Makes sense. North Vietnam was sending the troops to the south to fight, continue to fight the war. We killed off most of the main uh, force VC units in, in our actions, at least in our area. So they were ineffective. We were fighting NVA coming in off of an area called Charlie Ridge, which was to the west of where this battle that I fought with the, the rocket battalion, about another thousand meters in high up. Was full of NVA trails, and months, about four months later, fought intense battles on the side of that hill. And I was up there one time, and I know I can attest to the fact that but for the NVA coming in, the war in the South would have been over very shortly. Thank you, sir. Um, and it, so at this point, we're pretty well um, covered the. Uh, debrief that I wanted to, and we'll take a break and then move on to uh, your post-military um, career. Do you want to talk about Rich Cannon's platoon coming out? Yes, I would like to 
if you the, um, tell us about One thing I should add is that after a few hours of fighting, sometime in the early morning hours of uh, the next day, and I, I think it's the 21st, 22nd, I get the dates a little bit confused, but in any event, we moved out, I think, either on the 20th or the 21st and set up, and the battle took place in the middle of the night. Yes, sir, so, the citation reference is 20 December, so the next day would be 21 December. Okay, so somewhere around, my big concern, too, again, was when Lieutenant Gannon was being on his reaction platoon to reinforce us and perhaps have to save us if this enemy was overrunning us, which they were much larger force than they could have if they had been coordinated and not scattered by us. Uh, the uh, was bringing them in without getting them shot up by us because we were taking fire from all over the place. So I delayed uh, Rich Gannon's platoon coming in a little bit, I just kept talking to him. And he and I would just say, hey, Rich, just move slow, move slow. Everything by then was uh, in the clear. And he finally appeared, and I can remember uh, what a welcome sight it was for his, his platoon to be walking in. He's carrying a shotgun, and he's uh, got this grin on his face, and he said, looks like quite a firefight, Mike. So words to that effect. And boy, I never was happier to see anybody in my entire life. Yes, sir. And <clears throat> You uh, mentioned at another time that uh, you and uh, Rich Gannon Sr. were in a foxhole together and talked about the things that motivated you, and it may or may not have been formal religion, but uh, it was just, uh, you may have been an agnostic, but do you think yeah. your Irish uh, warrior culture that you shared with him was a helpful factor? Oh, it was. We talked about our Irish roots many, many times, and while he was a very staunch a religious Catholic. At that point in time in my life, I was not. And I had more agnostic leanings, which I have changed, and I'm a devout Catholic now. But uh, Rich was an example of a Marine whose uh, re religious faith gave him strength. And so even at that time, he was very religious? Oh, yeah. Well, I can share a little something. Uh, I'm sure you won't mind. He had never... Uh, uh, had, uh, I don't know if I should even talk about this, well, but I, meant, maybe before we'll, he went off on an R&R &R one time to Bangkok, I gave him some uh, advice, and uh, he, when he came back, he said he appreciated it. Well, we'll uh, leave that for uh, uh, Saskins uh, over a, uh, a whiskey, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, break at this point uh, to talk about uh, Secretary uh, Jim Mattis, in his confirmation hearing, uh, discussed the positive aspects of uh, post-traumatic growth, um, and he has also discussed this at... You both can be done. Okay, there you go. I'm just going to move my drawings. At his um, uh, public presentation at the Marines Memorial Club. Um, and. We're here and honored once again to be able to speak with uh, a Navy Cross recipient and retired Marine Brigadier General Neil. Um, I'd like to ask your, your thoughts generally on uh, these uh, issues about post-traumatic stress, and then we'll go on to some specific items on post-traumatic growth. Well, sure. my main thought is that anybody who goes into combat is going to have some stress involved and how long it lasts afterwards uh, is a matter of each individual. Most of us took it for granted that we're going to be killing people and we're going to see our friends die and that's uh, just a fact of life and that's what men have to accept in life. However, it seems like uh, in the recent years with some of the other uh, engagements we've
still that way. Uh, but you, you got to get over it and you got to move on. And doggone it, I just think repeated psychi psychiatric help is not necessarily the, the best treatment for them. Maybe in some cases, but I don't think so in most. That's my thing on it. So have you found uh, reunions to be uh, helpful for you and other Marines? Absolutely, absolutely. You get together with Marines that you serve with and they find out they're doing all right. Um, I was luckier than most. I was a little older, 18, 19 year old kids. Kids, I, it's kind of hard to call them kids now when they're in their 60s and early 70s, but uh, they, uh, it was tough on them, especially when they came home to a nation that didn't give a damn about them. And that was probably the hardest part for most of the veterans of Vietnam. They were never welcomed home like our veterans are today with open arms and embraces. We were not, we, many of them were spit upon and vilified and called baby killers and the like. And so some of these factors um, include relating to others. Um, as a result of your um, service, have you been able to uh, know that you can count on people in times of trouble or have a sense of closeness with others? Um, Absolutely. I mean, I think that comes from And I think a lot of that has to do with my experience in combat in Vietnam. And so, do you think that your um, experience has helped you to develop new interests and establish new paths in your life? Absolutely, absolutely. I realized there was a lot of things I didn't know very much about. I got married to a wonderful woman. We've been married for 47 years. I didn't get married till I was 31, a couple of years back from Vietnam. And uh, it uh, definitely matures you to serve in a combat role. And you feel you're able to do better things with your life due to your um, service? Absolutely. I mean, to me, uh, every day I'm just thankful for uh, being here after 50 years of uh, ago when I left a lot of 18, 19 year old young men behind who never had a chance to enjoy these 50 years and I'm thankful for that time and I try and give back whenever I can. Yes sir, and um, moving on to the factor of personal strength, do you have a uh, feeling of self-reliance due to your um, experience in the military? You bet. You learn that uh, Self-reliance, you rely upon, not only upon yourself, of course, but you're relying uh, upon the other Marines. 
but I had no question I was going to fight to the last, and I was well trained, and it gives you a lot of confidence in moving forward. And you feel that um, you have the uh, knowledge you can handle difficult situations? Uh your spiritual uh, faith now? Well, it did have some impact because uh, people like Rich Cannon, uh, who was a very devout Catholic, and others. I met a lot of priests uh, in the Marine Corps. It always, I could tell you a great story about a priest that came out. Can I you, you yes, get time for a story? We were on a bridge, uh, the last bridge in Da Nang, and our platoon was guarding it for one week, uh, Sunday to Sunday. And uh, the first Sunday on the bridge, the, I saw before the road sweep was open, I saw a jeep speeding towards our gate, which was the gateway into the south part of uh, uh, Vietnam. And it was a priest in there driving the jeep. And I, I said,